Hi everyone, uh, it's so good to see you. Uh, this is your second lecture for your first uh, autoethnographic project. We're going to talk about narrative autoethnography today. I'm going to give you some refreshers and some reminders of what makes powerful uh, narrative autoethnography, some which will be a little bit of review from the readings that you already did. Uh, and then I'm also going to introduce to you the authors and the performers for this particular unit and then talk you through the assignments that you're going to be doing. First, to remember uh, that what makes a solid, strong autoethnographic story is to be writing with strategic purpose. And uh, Carolyn Ellis gives us some great things to remember. Remember that people need to be depicted as accessible characters. We have to be able to see and hear, feel, and be in that space with you as the narrator, as well as these other characters you're interacting with. We have to feel that connection that you had in that moment, whether it was positive or negative, that relationship has to materialize for us. There has to be a tension. There has to be something that is happening to you that you're working through, responding to, and resolving. Now this tension means there's a temporal moving of events around it. Knowing this tension means you know when it begins, the middle of that story as you negotiate it, and where you're going to end it. That doesn't mean it's resolved, but what do we need to know for this particular message of your story, which brings us to that point or moral? There's a reason you're telling this story. You're helping us understand what it means to be a particular body situated in this cultural location. What are we learning about your identity and or your relationship to other bodies and other identities within a cultural space from this specific story? Also strategic attention to detail. Help us be in that space with you. Strategically, what do we need to know about, to be able to empathize and access this experience. Help us, again, to see, to feel, to hear, to touch, to know this space, and decide what you're going to emphasize by what we really need to understand in order to be in that space with you. What was significant? Is it what you heard? Is it what you felt? Is it what you saw? Is it what you tasted? What do we need to access this experience in order to get to the point that you want to make? Now, going back to another reading from last week, that idea of thinking about something being visceral. Remember, the term visceral comes from the viscera. Stories start in our guts where we feel that sinking feeling when something doesn't go the way we hoped it would be. When we get that flutter of nerves, of excitement, when we get that punch when we were so shocked, surprised, disappointed that something happened. Help us be enough in the moment that we feel that visceral reaction you had, whether it's that euphoric flutter that sink, that punch, we need to be there with you. Remember that storytelling is collaborative, that there is other bodies and identities in this story attend to helping us understand how you're seeing them. This might mean through reflection that perhaps you now have some insights that maybe you didn't at the time. Help those characters come alive for us. Also be aware of your audience and remember the word to collaborate means to work together. Know that that audience is working with you, trying to understand, trying to access, trying to empathize and be aware and give us what we need to be able to do that. Um, and also embrace that these stories are always susceptible. How you understand things can change. They can change with new knowledge. They can change with new experience. They can change with new relationships. 
I think about the idea of when I think of stories from my childhood and how I understood my mother during those times. Now I'm a mother myself. I understand them in different ways. As a professor, I've learned more about what it means to be working class. And I understand more of in that space I was in with my mother, how she was feeling and what she might have been thinking. And I'm able to relate in ways that maybe if I wrote that story 20 years ago, I wouldn't be able to. Our position in life and our understandings of others are always open to change with new information and new experiences and new relationships. So here are the assignments that are going to be due. You have an infographic, an autoethnographic narrative, a cover design, a video recorded dramatic slash performed reading, and an artist statement. And remember, each of these is a collaborative process with your peers and with me. We're going to talk through them on the discussion board. You'll get opportunities to revise before you submit your final assignment. First, uh, let's talk a little bit about the authors for this unit. You have Amber Johnson. Amber Johnson is going to be talking to you about sexual purity and sexuality and religion in her culture through an interaction she had and a man that she dated that was going to the ministry and how they negotiated their sexual relationship. Uh, Benny Lemester wrote a piece and he wrote it with multiple other uh, people that were he was with uh, in the California Los Angeles area. And everyone in the story uh, uses the pronoun there uh, for different reasons. And you're going to be listening to what it means to embrace a non-binary identity and what interactions happen and how we can understand and break down uh, binaries that can be violent to specific bodies. There is Robin's piece. Uh, Robin is going to talk to you about what, it, what, how she felt as a young black college student learning about feminism for the first time and how that's evolved over time and compelled her to produce the research and art that she produces now. You're going to read a little bit about Carolyn Ellis. You remember her from last unit. Uh, so with social class and regional identity, uh, she talks about her childhood growing up in the rural South as a working class child. And you'll be able to look at that, how the day to day life can help us understand uh, our own identity and the identities of others. I think it's nice this particular piece because it really does talk about the mundane daily life that made her who she is. And that, that might be something some of you decide to do. Um, Keith Berry is a gay man who writes about his life as an elementary schooler and what it was like uh, to experience it bullying because of his uh, gender expression and sexuality expression. So I am looking forward uh, to seeing your thoughts on those pieces. You'll end with Sarah Pennington, who talks about grief and reproduction and her decision not to have children after mourning the loss of her brother as a child. So these are very different writers. They come from very different standpoints and they uh, help us see a a lot of different cultural identities in different cultural locations and uh, what each can teach us about the world that we're in. I'm also going to have a couple of performers for this unit. I'm going to have you watch a 30 minute uh, closed caption adaption of my of my show that actually is opening in February here. Uh, that will be a little bit of a longer version and you'll be able to see that and that adaption from the first chapter that you read. Uh, from me in the first unit. You're also going to look at Brian LaBelle. Uh, he has a wonderful performance about cancer and masculinity. Uh, so that idea uh, to, to know that he's going to be performing and there's a response from Warren after seeing the piece. I'll also have you do a review from, Gru from Brian Grew because that book review really helped me decide what to emphasize in the show. So you'll see how we respond back and forth to one another to, to help us understand these different uh, cultural identities. And just a reminder that readings and viewings are fundamental to your infographics and information of your artist statements. Uh, so make sure as you are assigned a particular reading to really look in depth and to think about that particular reading and how it relates 
to these projects. That's why I have you watch the lecture for. So you're strategically making an infographic of information that you feel is most helpful as you move forward uh, creating your piece, as well as helps us understand these different identities. And uh, do that same thing as you respond to each infographic with different quotes from the readings. Uh, there's prompts to choose from. What is it like to live in your body? That is the idea. People read our bodies in certain ways. What's it like to live in yours? Uh, tell us where it exemplifies an identity category you identify with or your cultural location. And that can be, it does not, that does not have to be uh, uh, gender or race or sexuality or class or size. Of course, those always tend to be intersectional to no matter what identity that we're in. But I've had students tell a story about being a member of Greek life and the dynamics that have happened there. I had a, st a student tell a story about why they are in the profession they're in and how their body interacts in that space. So that might be so whatever kind of cultural category, uh, if you have to think of a, of a particular moment in a story that exemplifies that. Uh, tells a story of a relationship that you lost that stays with you. That can be a friend, a partner, a family member, an acquaintance, whatever you'd like. Uh, tell a story of where you're from, right? I know that no matter how far I go, I'm always from rural Maine, and I have stories from that that inform who I am and what it means to be someone from rural Maine. Uh, and you can also do that a different way. You might say, I'm not, I, I want to talk more about the cultural group I'm from, and you might do it more in that way. Uh, tell us a story of when you were misunderstood, right? When did people misread you? Think about why. How? Help us be there with you. Uh, tell us a story of regret. We all have those stories. Uh, tell us a story of conflict that changed who you are. Uh, you can also contact me with an additional prompt that you would like to respond to instead of one of these. Your assignment. Uh, first, you will create an infographic for one of the assigned readings in Canva. I will assign you which reading you'll create an infographic for. You will post your assigned infographic on discussion board three and you will respond to each of the infographics you did not create with a direct quote from the reading explaining why you think this excerpt is helpful to you as either a concept to understand or a strategy that exemplifies strong autoethnography. Remember, keep your project in mind, right? You're, this is early work as you start thinking about your artist statement. So uh, be strategic. You will then write a narrative autoethnography uh, between a thousand and two thousand words. Uh, you will First, have a paragraph of an idea of what you're thinking of on discussion four, and we'll talk through that. You will be assigned two classmates to respond to via the prompt to help them brainstorm, hone, think about different things they might not be thinking of. You'll share a draft of your story on discussion board five for feedback from both your peers and from me. You will be assigned one classmate to respond to with guided prompts to enable them to strengthen their story. That's going to be a follow-up to discussion board five. You will submit a final draft of your story on discussion board six and to the assignment on Canvas. You will respond to one classmate's story on the discussion board through guided prompts once again. So this is the collaborative process that we together, through our discussion boards, apply the readings to create great stories. You will then make a cover. Uh, an, it's an electronic cover design. So if this story was published, what would the cover look like? Uh, that means that we will, I'm going to have you read uh, different pieces on color theory from both a psychological and a marketing perspective to start thinking about what colors mean and what colors work with your story. We'll brainstorm that uh, and you will also share your responses to one another to think about what would an image B for this particular story, and that needs to also include a title as well as your name. So, and again, we'll have a we'll have a drafts so when you'll have chances to adjust before you submit your final assignment. You also do a performed reading for this assignment. Uh, we're gonna I'm gonna have you look over the fundamentals of a velfi <laughs> or a video selfie, and that, so that idea of this is a low tech. Uh, type of recording, which is what a lot of us have in our daily lives, learning how to do it well can be useful. So you're going to go through the basic tenets of what it means to perform a video selfie, uh, the fact that it should be in portrait mode, uh, the fact that you want to be mindful that the background is not distracting, that there's no light behind you that is turning you into a, into a dark uh, into a dark figure that we can't read. And so we'll talk more about that. Um, I'll, I'll revisit that a little bit in a little bit. But that's what you're going to do. And we're going to talk about how embodying and hearing the story is different from reading it and why we do both and in order to reach our audiences. 
Now, for your video of Elfie, I do want you to think about the script. You don't have to read the story verbatim, verbatim as you wrote it. I know that when I adapted my chapter to the stage, I changed quite a few things. So if as you're reading, there's a sentence that's long and you feel like you can't get a breath in or it just reads awkwardly for you, you can change it. Is there details that you're feeling you can leave out that you want to condense it? You want to make it a little bit tighter? That's an option to do. So go through and make sure you edit down your writing to make sure that it's easy for you to read. Uh, and then read it aloud over and over. Once you're comfortable, it, it will get easier. So when I say practice, don't just read it to yourself. That won't help. You need to get comfortable hearing your voice. You need to get comfortable looking up into your camera in order to record it. So practice, practice, practice until you can read it smoothly to us. That's okay if you're glancing down at your script. Of course, that's going to happen. But you want to make sure that we're able to see uh, your eyes and facial expressions. So again, I'm, I already said this once, I'm going to say it really quickly again, just because these are just basic tenets of good recording when you're doing it on your own or for someone else. Make sure you are lit from above, not down. That's just going to be a better way for us to see your face and be able to read your expressions. Also make sure the light is not coming from behind you because like I said before, you'll just be a dark figure. Keep the video in portrait mode and have a simple background in a quiet space. Why in portrait mode? Because really, because you're doing a self-recording, you're not going to be moving around a lot. So that portrait mode makes sure it's tight in on you. Uh, and then communicate emotion with facial expression and vocal variation, your tone, your pitch. Decide how are you going to get these emotions through to us. You need to feel I'm in the middle of recording. Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> the recording. Um, be mindful that you are lit from above, not down. I know I already said this, but I think that's something that people often forget. Try to do as much as you can to have a little bit of light coming from the sides as opposed to coming down. Why? Because you can end up looking very dark and we can't see your face as well. That's the same reason why we don't want you sitting in front of a window. You'll just be a dark figure. Uh, keep the video in portrait mode the entire time. Uh, why? Because you're not going to be moving around a lot because this is a, a reading that you're going to be having and most likely you're going to be self-recording. So because of this, you want it in portrait mode because it gets a tight on your face for us to be able to see your expressions. And uh, that brings us to how you communicate with us in a wealthy mode. And that's a facial expression, vocal variation. Think about your emotion emphasis. How are you feeling? How are you wanting that to come across? Think about what is that, what does that feel like? What does that look like? Empathize with your story. You go back to your words, get into that space again, and give a heartfelt rendition of that experience for your audience. And remember, always, if a sentence is hard to say, if it's a tongue twister, if you can't get it out in one breath, edit, edit, edit. Make sure that you are able to smoothly and easily read uh, your story to us. Last, there'll be the artist statement. It's a 1500 to 2000 word analysis about what we learn about a cultural identity experience. Uh, you'll have this in APA format. Although if you would rather do MLA or Chicago, depending on your background, let me know. I publish in all of those. I can be flexible. Uh, it should include at least two references from your readings. That's the assigned readings from this course. I chose those carefully because they relate to these assignments. So you need to uh, be able to cite two readings. Those can be those introductory readings from the first unit. They can be readings from this unit. But you need to be citing the readings as you use them. Uh, you can and you can explain autoethnography as a method, your artistic choices. If one of them relates to your identity or experience, that's great too. You'll use at least three peer-reviewed references from outside of class. Now, just remember, all of what you're reading here is peer-reviewed, except a few in the next unit. It's very important that for these peer-reviewed references, if you go to the library, you can click the peer-reviewed box. What that means is that it is a research piece that was read by at least two other experts in the field and deemed worthy of publication. So it's important that these other references you use have gone through this very rigorous vetting process. So check that box when you get to the library to make sure you're using peer-reviewed references for this section. If you need help with that, you can send me an email. I can help you make sure you're doing that correctly. 
And so these uh, three references should be helping you situate your experience within broader cultural understandings of identity. So you're going to look, and they can be from, of course, this is an interdisciplinary course. So they can be from any uh, database in the library you would like. Students tend to prefer communication and mass media complete or JSTOR, uh, or sometimes sociological ab abstracts, but I'm fine with you being wherever you would like. Uh, and then you will uh, give a paragraph um, explaining your focus on the insight you wish to provide about a cultural identity and experience when you submit your final story and cover design on discussion board six. So you're going to experience, to put these all in together, uh, you're going to be, ugh. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your artist statement. So this idea of, okay, your artist statement. Uh, your artist statement is a 1,500 to 2,000 word analysis of what we learn about a cultural identity or experience from your, your autoethnographic story in APA format. This is when you tell us why you decide to tell this story and uh, what it teaches us. It should include at least two references from your readings. They can be used to explain autoethnography as a method, your artistic choices, your identity experience, whatever is relevant to your particular project, you need to cite two readings from class. You then need at least three peer-reviewed references from outside of class. Now, peer-reviewed means that it was a research study that at least two other professionals in that field decided was worthy of publication. So it's important that you choose uh, articles that have gone through this process from our library databases. You can check the box that says peer-reviewed and make sure that everything you're looking at is peer-reviewed. Uh, so you are free to use any database and library you would like. Uh, this is an inter interdisciplinary course. Uh, I find that students enjoy uh, pieces from Communication and Mass Media Complete, the ERIC databases, and Sociological Abstracts, but that doesn't mean that any database wouldn't be great. Um, students also have told me they enjoy JSTOR. So wherever you would like to go, you are just going to need to find three peer-reviewed references that are going to be integrated into this artist statement. Now, after you write this 1,500 to 2,000 word analysis, you will post it to the discussion board and uh, when you're looking for feedback and you will also have a paragraph that explains uh, what kind of emotions and feelings and message that you are hoping to communicate, um, as well as uh, through both this artist statement and your cover design. The final draft is going to be due on discussion board 8, as well as uploaded to the Canvas assignment.